Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Joel Reed. I'm the executive director of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. Um, this network represents one of the world's largest robotics communities. Uh, you very, very much likely know, thanks to Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh has led the world in the development of robotics technologies and solutions, um, including being credited for helping start the artificial intelligence industry and leading that sector. And now we're becoming more known uh, for the breadth and the depth of our uh, commercial community. Uh, we have over 100 members representing nearly 18 different industry segments, nine of which have five companies or more. So we are both broad and deep. And we just added seven new companies, new startups, uh, in just the last uh, six to eight weeks. So we were growing uh, uh, very rapidly. Uh, so with all of this, we do consider uh, Pittsburgh to be the robotics capital of the world. It's our mission to connect many of you in the audience today uh, with the companies that are on our panel and, um, and with the key stakeholders within our rapidly growing community. Together, we hope to accelerate the overall adoption of autonomous systems, these machines that are looking uh, to improve our lives and solve some difficult problems. Uh, so please check us out. Um, you can find us on Twitter. And I believe in the slide set, um, we have the information for uh, accessing uh, that information. All right, it's coming up now. And, uh, and also follow us on, on LinkedIn. In fact, I checked just recently, uh, I'd say we have just a little bit over 4,600 followers. So I encourage you uh, in the world of multitasking and, and digital, um, interactions. So jump over to LinkedIn and, and follow us now if you're not. I'm going to watch that ticker go up. Uh, so thank you. Today, we're going to talk about raising capital uh, for what is inherently a capital intensive business. Uh, we have a phenomenal panel. Uh, if they covered just half of what we talked about during the practice session, you're going to gain what I believe to be variable, very valuable insights. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just as a reminder, our webinar is part of the Robotics Business Spotlight Series, where we highlight business challenges facing ro robotics and autonomous uh, companies. And we talk about successes and even failures um, in their pursuit of building their businesses. This is an emergence, emerging industry. Uh, thus, it's very important for us to bring experts like today's panelists to discuss how we accelerate uh, individual businesses and the industry overall. Uh, before we do start, I want to recognize our leading sponsors. The organizations that are listed here um, are leaders in their respective sectors. Um, we have leader, academic leaders such as Carnegie Mellon University, which is one of our founding sponsors, and the University of Pittsburgh, um, a sustaining sponsor for the organization. Uh, businesses that are driving growth and helping our companies build their presence in their industry, such as JP Morgan, today's top sponsor, and also the Denton's law firm and Cowan. And uh, in the autonomous development space, we have leaders that define the Pittsburgh community, notably in autonomous vehicle development. One of our founding sponsors is Argo AI, and one of our sustaining sponsors uh, is Aurora. Uh, today's presenting sponsor is JP Morgan. I'm gonna let Justin Krauss, our moderator, tell you more about JP Morgan. But what I would like to say is, is that JP Morgan has been an early leader in developing the commercial cluster in Pittsburgh. Much of that has to do with Justin's efforts and leadership. And Justin, for that, we are very thankful. Um, Justin is the executive director in JP Morgan's technology and disruptive commercial uh, banking team, where he helps the innovation economy, companies in the innovation economy connect and leverage the worldwide resources of JP Morgan. Uh, before joining the firm, he worked in corporate banking in the corporate banking division at PNC, another Pittsburgh uh, leader, and also in the Global Executive Compensation Group at Credit Suisse. Um, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to build relationships with people like Justin and with firms like JP Morgan. This definitely, in, in my mind, falls into the category of let's work smarter, not harder. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin, and I'm looking forward to a fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, thanks for the intro. And, and I'm far and away the least interesting person on the panel today, so you guys know. Um, and that will come out really, really quickly here. But again, thanks so much again, um, Justin Krauss from, from JP Morgan. And, you know, 
one of the the best things about my job, work with a lot of founders, um, I help lead our robotics and automation practice in the commercial bank, working closely with our investment bank and 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 other partners across JP Morgan, uh, including Andy Kelly, who's on the phone here on the Zoom today. What I would say about it, what's a, the best part of this job, though, is what you're going to hear when when Brandon and Agino start talking here in a few minutes, um, because hearing founders, hearing their stories, talking about, to be candid, the challenges as well as um, uh, the achievements of which which <laughs> there's a pretty big one on the panel as well, and, and there's going to be more coming, um, is, is far and away the best part of the job. So super excited. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, as Joel said... PRN. I actually wore my shirt today. I have my PRN shirt today. So I'm very excited to show off uh, uh, my bona fides. Um, you know, we do believe Pittsburgh's the robotics capital of the world, but we're not going to um, sort of circle the wagons and not have folks and perspectives, right? Because it is a global industry. And so that's what's exciting today. We have some outside voices, some inside Pittsburgh voices. And um, as we dig in here a little bit, um, I think it's going to be a really good conversation. Um, so, so with that, let's get right to it here quickly, and let me inter briefly introduce the panel uh, quickly, and, and I'll start here with Brandon. So Brandon Catino is the co-founder and CEO of Four Growers, um, and he's going to talk, talk a lot more about the business, but uh, Four Growers, uh, prior to starting Four Growers, he built competition-winning robots, created algorithms to to optimize solar panel output and design and built a low cost IoT water quality sensor. And, and when you hear about four growers and the work it's doing in the agricultural space, that background, you start understanding where he came from, um, at least uh, in build building the business, the idea behind the business. Um, and then in addition, he's had the opportunity to grow teams from five to 60 people. He's led groups of 120 people. And I think that um, right now he's in full-blown hiring mode. So I think, he, I don't know if, he, if he's getting to 120 this year, but I know he's uh, looking for talent out there. So thank you so much for being, being a part of this today, Brandon. Um, next, Gino Cafiero is the CEO of Bear Flag Robotics. And you might've heard of them because they were actually acquired by John Deere in 2021. Um, in that, you know, most of the folks in this webinar, you follow robotics news, follow the raises, follow exits. And this was clearly a, 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 a massive one and exciting one that we'll talk a little bit about. Bear Flag uh, develops autonomous technology that can be added to farm tractors as a performance upgrade. Um, Gino is also a former founder and has a, a business experience across a broad range of sectors, including automotive telecom and ag, obviously where, where Bear Flag plays pretty heavily. Um, prior to founding Bear Flag, Igino was a product manager at Cisco and he earned his BS in ECE at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, also went to a school called Stanford, got an MS in electrical engineering and an MBA from somewhere called Wharton as well. So I guess those are other schools out there. Um, but anyway, thank you very much, Agina, for joining us. And finally, I've got my friend and colleague. This started, I have to say, where I was like, Andy, why don't we do this? And, and you know, we'll talk about capital for a while. And then it was, it was, I think, quick, we realized, why don't we get two great founders to join us to make it much, much more interesting? But but. Andy is a, is a friend and a colleague. He joined uh, JP Morgan to cover the venture ecosystem. He actually came from Silicon Valley Bank where he had built deep relationships with general partners across two dozen venture capital firms on the West Coast. It, what's interesting about Andy and which makes him much different from me is that prior to SVB, he actually spent 15 years in operating roles across three technology companies, um, ranging from Microsoft to a startup that was begun actually, I think in his living room in San Francisco. And so again, it, it, he brings a nice perspective of not just knowing investors, but also knowing sort of the other side of it as well. So with that, um, really quick sort of opening there. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us. Let's just start, if you wouldn't mind, give a quick high level there, but, but Brandon, maybe we'll start with you. If you wanna just give you know, a, a minute or two on four growers and just tell us a little bit more about the business you're building. Yeah, thanks, Justin, for the intro. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. So in case you haven't heard of us before, which you may not have because we're still pretty quiet, uh, Four Growers has built a tomato harvesting system for greenhouse farms. And really for us, the vision of Four Growers is not around robotics, but really how do we improve our food system? And so our goal is really to provide sustainably grown and access to lower cost healthy produce. And when we were really looking at the agricultural space, we learned about the greenhouse industry, which you can have 200 acre greenhouses 
growing fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables under glass, 90% more water efficient, 25 times higher land efficiency, no herbicides, no pesticides. And we thought this was just amazing. And we started calling all these different greenhouses and asking, what do you need to be able to grow and help us produce food at scale in this form? And everyone said automation. And so that's how we came to building them a tomato harvesting system to be able to reduce their automation costs, as well as also provide them automation because they're lacking the availability and labor. They just can't find people to pick the tomatoes they need. And so now we began in 2018. And in the last three years, we've had uh, some great investors back us, not, not quite as great as a Gino, we're on our way there, um, but we are moving forward. We have three different customers. We've now picked over hundreds of thousands of tomatoes that have gone to grocery store shelves. Uh, so there's actually a chance you may have eaten a tomato that we picked. And then we have uh, signed uh, demand from customers worth over tens of millions of dollars. Excellent, thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and terrific. And I, I think if you haven't had a tomato yet picked by, uh, Brandon's company, you will eventually, right? That's the, the, the way the trajectory is going. Um, Gino, how about over to you? Uh, Justin, Brandon, awesome to be here. Um, thanks so much for, for having me. Yeah, so quickly, just to um, put some, some scaffolding around Bear Flag. Bear Flag builds autonomous technology for farm tractors. Um, and so throughout um, the company's life, we've never wanted nor intended to build the tractors themselves. We leave that to the OEMs to build uh, mighty fine machines the green ones are the best in the world um, rather we build technology that goes on them so we source tractors from dealerships rental fleets um, even customers themselves um, apply the sensors and compute necessary to make those autonomous and then provide them back to growers as a service um, and there's a lot of in outs and what have you and now that we're part of the the deer ecosystem the deer family the possibilities um, are are much larger um, and the horsepower behind us is much larger as well, which is truly exciting. Um, and it gives us uh, it gives us an opportunity to continue on our mission, which is to increase global food production while reducing the cost of growing through food through machine automation. So there's a lot there to unpack, but that defines what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Awesome. Thank you. And finally, Andy. Thanks for uh, having me, uh, Eugenio and Brandon and Justin. I appreciate it. Um, I, my role really is to work closely with the venture firms, as Justin mentioned, and it works sort of bi-directionally. I try to do as much as I can uh, for their portfolio companies. So sort of the top of the alphabet would be firms like Andreessen Horowitz and Excel, and down towards the bottom, Sequoia uh, at the bottom of the alphabet and a bunch in between. And really it's sort of being thoughtful around their portfolio companies and how JP Morgan can help them. I also try to do some in reverse where there are really interesting startups uh, that if um, I can find a good fit, try to make sure that the firms that I work with know about some of these really interesting startups, like four growers in this case. Eugenio, you've moved past me, but, uh, but Brandon and others uh, here to be helpful. So, you know, my eye is really, my sort of primary client is the venture capital ecosystem. But having said that, you know, I spent 15 years, as Justin said, working at startups. And so what has been a lot of fun is using the lens that I had on some of the struggles that every startup faces, and they're all frankly quite common, um, and you know, try to bring to bear some of the resources we have here to help smooth those out. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. All right, so I, as I mentioned, you know, Andy and I talked about this and, and we said, well, look, you know, thinking about some interesting folks out there, we didn't intend to have two companies in, the ag space, right? I mean, that wasn't in, and for those who know the Pittsburgh uh, robotics scene, we certainly have a lot of strong ag robotics for, but we have, you know, a ton. So it's interesting that this is the case, but it's obviously a massive problem. We both alluded to a couple a couple pieces of, of the problem you're solving. The question was, was some of it that you had, you understood the problem and you tried to build a technology to, to fix a problem, right? Or was it more, um, and Brandon, maybe we'll start with you, that, um, you you had a technology and you went to look for a problem. So 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 is it the problem or the tech first, and maybe and then we'll go to Gino after you. Yeah. So in our case, it was very heavily the problem first, and then building the tech around it. Really, just going back to how can we provide healthy, low cost produce grown in a sustainable way. So we looked at everything from vertical farms to outdoor farming and greenhouse farming, and really kind of concluded that greenhouse farming was what we thought would be the future of vegetable production and just learning what did they need uh, to be able to help grow and scale. And it was just uh, honestly a, a happy accident that it turned out automation and robotics uh, was the solution that they needed because that's my background and my co-founder's background. 
Excellent. And Regina? Yeah, Jess, I, I would say the exact same thing, right? So we actually got pulled in, pulled towards the problem. My in-laws are in construction aggregate mining in rural Oregon. So like, I mean, when Braden talks about the labor problem, like, you know, whether it's tomato harvest or produce or corn and soy or um, construction aggregate mining or even trucking, marine construction, like this, this just um, vac this labor vacuum is um, just so present in all these industries. And there's so much opportunity here. But anyway, long, long story short, got pulled into it via mining, um, started looking at other applications too, started talking to, um, actually, we had a, a moment where I was doing diligence on quarries. Um, and one of the folks I went to business school with actually owned an orchard too. And she said, Gino, come out. Like, I understand what you're trying to do in quarries, but like, come out and spend some time on our orchard. Um, mm. And I love to learn. And that day was in 2016. It fundamentally changed the course of my life. Um, went out, spent the day with her, like, got it like it took about an hour to you know the first hour by like 10 a.m i was like oh man this is like this is there's a lot here um and so started building a thesis around it talked to hundreds of growers that summer um if you if you if you can name a crop we probably talked to someone who grows it and really started to put a thesis together about how we can have the most impact um and you know the story evolved 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 and it's not a straight path um and that's really where you know where verify was born the thesis for verify was born but cer certainly problem first. Um, yeah. We're, st we're still figuring out the tech, right? Like it's a, it's problem first um, for sure. And, and so, and to that point, as you know, maybe I'll stick with you for a second, then did, was there any hesitation? I mean, one, this is about capital, right? Raising capital for robotics. And we talk about what a, what a struggle is on the early stage of like what it's going to take to get us to that next level. So was there any hesitation when you know, you, you know, there's a fact pattern, identified a problem, start work towards a solution, but it's pointing toward this technology that's going to require some capital at an earlier stage. Did that dissuade you? Did, I mean, did it, did you sort of look at this and say, is there another way we can do this? I'm curious about that. Um, no, it, it didn't dissuade us. It was just another challenge. Right. Um, and I mean, that's the thing to call out, right? People are like, oh, you know, um, this, you know, this area is hot or it's a good time for fundraising or it's an awful time for fundraising or like, you know, investors aren't really looking at agriculture, like, or they're really looking at agriculture. And you hear these like huge waves of momentum. Um, in my personal experience, it was always a story about bear flag raising money. And I actually, as much as I heard these other things, it was always, it's always very difficult to raise capital, right? Like, um, you know, you read the funding announcements, you read like, oh, you know, four growers raise money, bear flag raise money, like XYZ startup raise money. And it, it's like, oh my gosh, like that's a huge amount from like a great investor, but that's that's months and months of work and heaps and heaps of rejection um, and a ton of really smart people, a ton of really, um, really strong investors telling you your ideas, you know, this is a trash can idea. It's not going to work. And they don't say it directly like that, but <laughs> mean, right? And, and you have to wade through that to get to, yeah. to get to yes. And I guess that we can talk about that later, but um, just long story short, fundraising is really hard. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, and of course it's a challenge, but I don't, I wouldn't say it dissuaded us inherently, right? It's just part of one of, one of the many things you have to be good at to, to do a startup. Great. What about you, Brandon, any perspective on that question or? So for us, when we kind of thought about the, the hardware piece, a lot of it was we were looking at the problem we had to solve. And we did try to see, is there a more capital efficient way where we didn't need hardware and we could just get away with software? And we didn't see a way where it really provided the same amount of value and addressed that same huge need that growers had. We heard a lot of, especially what you hear for us in the space is plant analytics. Uh, everyone always says, like, if you could do yield forecasting, that'd be great. If you could tell me disease detection, that'd be great. It's a, it's a nice to have. But then the second you ask someone, how much is that worth to you? Like, are you ready to pay for it? I was like, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I don't know. And I'm not ready to put money down to find out. Uh, and on top of that, you have these very long sales cycles when you're talking about analytics and the software-based approaches because you have to go through whole crop seasons. And so for us, when we were really looking at it, it's like, there's this analytics problem was the other one we heard, but it was really seemed like automation was the big need. And so for us, then it came into looking, all right, if, if automation is the need, this is what it's going to take to get there. And then as Agino said, it's not something that's necessarily uh, impossible. It's just another barrier. It's uh, almost, I don't know if it's a fair comparison, but if you kind of think of playing like video games on different levels, you know, if you have a lot of capital that you need, maybe it's a, a really difficult level to try to raise capital for because it's not your traditional venture backed model. And so you do have to take that into account. And I think uh, Andy can probably speak a little bit more to it. 
Um, but I think the community around robotics is starting to create new instruments that are geared towards helping robotic companies scale and taking on some of that capital intensivity of hardware and making it so you don't have to do that through fundraising, but you can use other type of debt financing. Excellent. Um, one thing I, I think would be interesting, especially for folks that are on the earlier stage that are on the phone and are on Zoom, we have you know sort of all over the place, but you guys both went through YC, right? And in and, and, and curiosity there in terms of, could you talk about that experience a little bit and, and how it shaped its effect on the business model or how it shaped you guys? And Gino, if you want to start with that one. Yeah, happy to. I mean, I think this also um, comes back and um, maybe it's because um, maybe that's why both companies went through YC or it's a product of YC. I mean, cause or effect, I'm not sure, but YC is a product school, um, full stop. There's, there's like 10 or 20 things that you need to be good at to, um, you know, to do startup and like, you know, bear flags, like kind of crappy at all of them, but like you have to have proficiency. The one that really matters or the one that YC really bangs over the head is product market fit. Right. right? And it's not a point, it's a process. And you can have basically everything else in your company go wrong. But if you have product market fit nailed, you have a chance of success. If you have everything else going right, but you don't have product market fit, probably not going to work. And so YC really hammers on this point of build something people want, right? Like how can you quickly iterate? How can you not believe your own BS that this is actually what they want? And they don't know it yet. How can you actually go and um, quantify how much they want it and then build a company around that pull? Like that's what YC does exceedingly well. That was, um, you know, that, that was time exceedingly well spent. And you hear in what Brandon says too, right? There, I, I'm smiling because this is like, this is like our, my doppelganger across the country, right? But <laughs> everyone says they want analytics. Everyone says they want data. And then you're like, well, yeah, like, but what do you need? And it's, I need help in my fields. I need automation, right? And so um, how can we give them what they need? And you can craft it. You know, listen, I've done it. I'm guilty of this too. I'm sure Brandon is too. You can craft this incredible narrative around once we're in the field delivering value, looking at the insights and analytics, and we can increase yields and lower costs and increase efficiencies and literally, quite literally solve world hunger. But like first principles is, you know, what's like, let's help them with the blood that's gushing out of their neck today. Um, and that's labor. Um, and YC drives that home completely. Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Brandon say it better than I can, but that, that was certainly my takeaway from YC. No, I think uh, you hit it on the head. You did a great job. I think too, just with that analytics piece, which Regina did start talking about was that almost like platform-based approach is there's a real value to analytics. And I definitely want to make sure in my last comment, I didn't belittle analytics because so there's value. But it makes sense to come in first with hardware, be the platform, and then you can start adding on all this extra value on top of automation. Um, but to go specifically back to kind of the YC question, fully agree 100% with what Gino said. YC is really amazing at making a focus on the real product and the real problem. I think as technologists, there's a lot of draw for us of like, this tech is really cool. And like, I want to solve this, or I want to go through this challenge, or I want to fix this, you know, algorithm. But really YC is good at drawing back of, well, does that actually have any value to your customer? And if not, you're just wasting time and resources chasing something for fun that isn't going to help move the business forward. And so I think there's this really great piece of advice around YC and kind of that whole mantra. I think it's very valuable. And then the other thing for us that was extremely helpful, uh, honestly, just kind of being younger, not having an established network is the network that YC provides you. Uh, it was actually through YC that Agino and I uh, met each other. And Agino has been great. Uh, whenever we have problems, we can I can call Agino and ask Agino for his take, what he's gone through. On uh, stories like mine, every other YC company has it. And so you get this really great network of founders as well as a great network of investors. Um, for me, I know in our first capital raise, it was a big question of how do you actually raise capital? Where does it come from? You know, where do you get your first million? Uh, and really it's do I see you learn that the easiest way, not easiest, one of the, my opinion, best ways is through angel investors. And YC has this great network of incredible angel investors. Like I don't, I'd have to double check if I can say who they are publicly, but we have some like amazing investors in our company. I know Gino has amazing investors in his too. And a lot of those have come through uh, that YC network. Got it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so what about um, Andy? So when you think about, and we talk a little bit about hardware and, and, and some of the challenges there of just the amount of capital necessary, especially to get, you know, up in sort of moving. Has, in your experience with investors, 
how has their perspective changed or has it changed at all in terms of the way they view hardware, especially with some of the sensor technologies and other things that are coming up that, that do create an opportunity for data? Maybe not an ag just yet. They're not paying for it yet, but but there's there's some value there that's starting to unlock. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I think, I mean, right now, and I think, uh, you know, Eugenio and Brandon are certainly aware of this, as I'm sure many people are, is that this is a peculiar time. Like, you know, if you are in the venture ecosystem, money is effectively falling out of the skies, right? You know, with, with, with market rates, yields being so low, you know, traditional uh, pools of capital, the you know, endowments and pensions and uh, sovereign wealth funds are looking for anything that is greater than zero in terms of a return. And that's going into alternative assets. So in our case that we, I think of that is, you know, as venture capital, private equity, things like that. And it is a, I would say, a uniquely good time to be raising equity if you're a founder, because you can frankly get so much more in the way of capital now for so much less dilution than you would have even five years ago. And so that's a peculiar function that's not related, obviously, to hardware. That's just the broader ecosystem. Um, but I would say, I think there's been a really interesting, it's almost like a bit of a sine wave that's roll. It probably rolls through over time. But if I went back to you know the time when I was at Microsoft in the early aughts, and when we started Voxer uh, in 2007, you, know, you still had from an investing perspective, you know, startups were still capital intensive, right? You know, you, you still, you had to have servers, you had to have them in your office, you had to have all of that there, right? There was no uh, off-prem and there certainly was no cloud other than nascent, you know, Salesforce, but you had to basically as a venture investor, be ready to put up a bunch of money just to get this company started. And then, you know, you see through the late aughts, a rolling shift partly developed by the app store, right? The ability to, you know, offload all this development of all these different applications to individuals and small businesses um, that of course, some of them became major businesses, but, you know, allowed them to do it, you know, on their own sort of off of the Apple platform um, where, you know, the cost of computing came down rapidly, you know, I mean, if, and to make a gross analogy, right. It was that you could go to a coffee store with your Mac and you could create a business, right. And that's such a sea change from, you know, post.com bust where you still needed all of these things, you know, and you had to pay for them as a founder. So I think what's really interesting is, you know, the capital intensity came down. If you move into the 2010s, you know, you saw, you know, an enterprise SaaS company, frankly, could be started with uh, a couple of people, a couple of laptops, a good coffee shop, and the ability to put out a minimum viable product that got someone testing your product inside their business and potentially ideally using it. And at, at that point, it was probably still on-prem. So you hadn't even gotten to the better part of sort of lower capital intensity, but it was a big step forward. And I think in terms of, of, you know, of robotics, I think what started to happen through that period was you had sort of the core levels of, of building. I'm, I would kind of call it the like, the like infrastructure, pl you know, platform level being developed, the core systems that you needed to power things like Bear Flag and Four Growers. And investors, I feel like started to, you know, you, would, you always had specialization um, you know, you will have in any given firm, typically a partner or two who maybe does focuses on enterprise infrastructure. You might have someone who does consumer, you know, direct to consumer kinds of businesses. Maybe who's someone who does fintech, hard tech, and this, you know, both founders here fall into this. Fewer and farther in between. You know, there are firms like Drive Capital and Columbus that are incredible in terms of their, their belief in the thesis that there's a huge transformation occurring and have backed some amazing companies doing robotics and automation. There are individual partners in other places, but you know what you need as you move forward off of the core platform are people that really get the thesis in terms of where things are going, like to Brandon's point, like how do you make sustainable agricultural real at scale, not just real in theory or real in small doses, but at scale? And same for Regino, right? Like, how do you trans transform industries where, you know, and, and you know, mentioned this, it's really amazing, right? When you look at like the future state for truck drivers and, you know, uh, uh, orchard workers, farm workers, like, you know, between sort of retirement, 
lack of appetite to take those jobs, immigration challenges like we face in all the, and I'm in California as the background may show, right? Like, you know, the ag industry in California has a big challenge coming, which is if you aren't allowing immigrants in, and you don't have, you know, some form of picking automation, you have a lot of, you have a huge missed opportunity. So I do think though, there are individual investors that get it and there's a lot of capital. And I think the thing that has really helped automation in particular, beyond my sort of smaller worldview, which is, I'm just going to paraphrase, Sand Hill venture capital firms, but broadly venture, the venture community, is the, the interest and desire of corporate sort of slash strategic investors to get involved, to solve problems that they see every day, right? So John Deere is a great example. You know, They will invest and they will acquire, as Eugenio knows, and there are other businesses, you know, ConAgra and, uh, you know, all of these large sort of firms, Continental Grain, that are investing in this and adding more capacity in very specific places. So I feel like where venture capital sort of helps, you know, it it understands capital intensity, it, it likes it to be less capital intensive for obvious reasons, they can own more for having put less out the door. Um, and the core platforms really got built. You can always continue to improve upon them. But I think as you start to get very to very specific application areas like Eugenio and Brandon have done, there are some firms that can be good early, take the risk. And then what's really great is having things like corporate and strategic uh, funds that can really say, you found the product market fit and we are going to come in now and really help you expand markets, expand toeholds and you know, geographies, adjacent industries, things like that with all of the know-how and the customer base that they built. So, you know, again, John Deere is a great example of that. Like the markets that that opens up and the adjacencies that it opens up would have been hard to do by himself and can really be scaled more rapidly, you know, with their firepower behind them. So it's kind of been a big rolling wave over time, but I think it has, you know, the capital intensity is, is certainly important in this case. And you have to be a risk taker, which venture capital firms, you know, certainly claim to do. Because early on, you just don't know, like, will this really solve the right problem? And is it a big enough problem? And some people have good thesis around that and, and really believe it. And, um, and others, you know, see it day to day in their businesses and, and have helped. Mm. Really, really, thanks, Andy. Um, and I guess on that point, and, and obviously, Brendan, you know, if you, have, if you feel free to jump in here as we're kind of going through, because I wanted to walk down this, this thought a little bit. So in terms of forms of capital, we know, I mean, we work for a very big bank, right? Um, we know there's a lot of non-bank lenders that are out there doing equipment leasing and other forms. What do you hear from the VCs you talk to about their attitude toward debt in terms of the amount of equity that's out there, as you alluded to, right? We know there's a lot, but then also the availability of debt vehicles and how that's sort of viewed because there's an opportunity there from a cost of capital standpoint, but there's also like the, some hooks that come with the debt sometimes, right? And, and, and sort of the flexibility. So could you talk about that? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, with so much equity flowing into our broad ecosystem, just, you know, the startup innovation economy, it, broadly speaking, you know, the amount of money that's coming in, there's a challenge in that venture firms in many cases want more of their dollars to go to work. And so they look at things like debt as a competitive product. Uh, and vice versa. And so there are times that that I feel like that occurs more in sort of an enterprise, you know, um, SaaS model where, you know, it's off to the races because they've got the product market fit and you're like, we want to own as much of this business as possible. I think the challenges in, in, in robotics is a little bit different. And I think this is why you start to see um, some really interesting and creative ways to be helpful which are, you know, to use equity dollars. So if you raise a $20 million Series A, which is sort of the, you know, crazily enough, become sort of the, what seems like the standard, um, you don't necessarily want to use equity dollars to finance the purchase of hardware, robots, um, tractors, whatever that might be, because that's, that's not the ideal use. You'd rather be using that to work on your engineering, to hire more, to literally hire more engineers, to, you know, work on biz dev with big partner opportunities, not to purchase stuff. And VCs don't want that. And founders may or may not want that as well. And so you start to find, we've, we've started to see, you know, solutions that are more tailored, you know, you could call them loosely, you know, HaaS, hardware as a service, right? Where you can use banks, 
um, you know, commercial banks to say like, I'd like to borrow and I'd like to use the money I've borrowed to purchase the, you know, the, the inventory or the components I'll need. And I'm going to do it because you've, I've already got contracts, right? You know, Brandon says he's got, you know, he's already got clients that look sort of point towards tens of millions of dollars of, of, of revenue. And I'm going to basically borrow against these future contracts. And, but, but because I have to acquire the stuff ahead of time, that's where it can be really a helpful product, right? With, with a SaaS product, you know, you basically get people to pay upfront at the beginning of the year. And you, you know, obviously meter out your software over the course of the year. It's different here. You've turned it around where it's like, I need to buy out this very expensive stuff now. And in the case of robotics, right, it can be half a million dollars, depends on what you're, what you're actually providing, but it can be very capital intensive and you're not going to get paid until you've delivered it. And that's an upside down kind of problem. That's not great for cash flow and startups. And so, you know, you do find solutions like Haas. That can be really helpful, right? To smooth that out. And then obviously as you hit scale, you know, you, you can lessen your dependence on those kinds of things. And, you know, and, and the world I sit in is, you know, as we work with early stage founders, you know, it's fairly common to say like, we'll lend you some it's called term debt, right? Where it's a chunk of cash, do whatever with, with it, whatever you like, and, you know, you will pay it back over the course of four years. Um, you know, as companies grow in scale, then you start to have lower cost of capital things like revolvers and lines of credit that allow you to do that same sort of thing. But that's hard at the very early end of the business where you're still proving it out and you're on your first customer, but not your 20th. And you need to sort of get the crank turning and have this inventory so that you can get ahead of the curve and be able to deliver the product you have told your customer you will. So I do think it's shaping up specifically in, in sort of automation in a different way to be helpful and complementary to the the equity that's out there. Great. I don't know, Gino, Brandon, do you have anything yeah. you want to jump in there? I, I do. Um, couldn't agree with any more. Um, as a founder, I completely undervalued this in the early days. And finally, when I understood it in the last 12 months or so, like, you know, investor pitches went great. Like, of course, an investor pitch, you pitch the vision. You're like, this is how BearFlag takes over the world. This is, look at this untapped opportunity. We're doing the thing. And they're like, yeah, but it'll be expensive. And I'm like, no, 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 don't worry about that. Check this out. Do, 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 do. And it allays that fear. So another way to think about what Andy's talking about is use equity for things that are massively differentiated. So these are things like IP and engineering and what your secret sauce is. And the reason you use equity is because the value of that is undetermined. It, works, it could be worth a gazillion dollars. It could crash to zero. That's what an investor is underwriting is that the value of those differentiated things will skyrocket. Use debt for things that are completely undifferentiated like steel or components or, um, you know, like, in, Ver in Verflex cases, tractor, tractors or hardware, right? Like LIDARs are undifferentiated enough that we could go to a bank and get a loan for those LIDARs. So put in practical terms, like um, I don't want to talk too specifically about Verflex, but this really helps. We had a slide in our deck that says Verflex doesn't need CapEx to scale. And here's why. We rent our tractors so we don't pay until those start actually hitting fields. And then we go get contracts from growers to do work. We go to the bank, we get debt to buy those kits and they underwrite it with the contracts they already have. So now all of a sudden we're renting tractors, doesn't come out of our pocket. We take debt on the hardware that we're gonna install on those tractors. We go to the field, we make the money, we pay the rental company, we pay the bank and we're out the door and all of your $20 million series A goes to things that differentiate us and move the company forward. They don't go to rentals or to pay our invoices for hardware. Investors love that. I had completely underestimated the value of explaining that to an investor. Like it changed the conversation completely. Hey, Eugenio, I think that's a great point. And the one thing you didn't say there, but is implicit is in, in that sort of circle you just made is your, your post money on your A went from being $40 million post to a $200 million post because you've shown that you can make that circle work and, and all then you really are starting to do is do it at scale, right? That's, that's the point is that you're the value of your IP went up dramatically in the course of that cycle. That's exactly right. Mm. Incredible. And, 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 you know, thanks for the insight. And, and you're talking about that deck. I mean, you know, that's exactly what this webinar, that's exactly what these discussions are about, like sharing those kind of insights for this broader group. So thank you so much um, um, to share, to share through that. Um, 
Let me ask this question here around talking a little about valuation, right? Andy, you just brought up valuation a little bit. And so I'm curious because, um, and, and again, in different places where, where you two guys are right now, but just thinking about it, sometimes I hear from founders valuation and its effect on talent attraction, right? Right or wrong, people will say this, that, hey, this bigger valuation of these investors, I get better folks, engineers coming to me, right, that, that want to work for me. Um, I'm, I'm curious, is that is that true in your experience or how do you think about valuation and its effect on sort of the team, the culture, right? Like, like, could you talk about a little bit your own experiences? Go for it, Brandon. Yeah, I can start with that one. Um, I think for us, what we've seen, Brandon, uh, you know, we have Aurora here in Pittsburgh now and all these other AV companies with multi-billion dollar valuations, but at least for us being more on kind of the earlier stage, smaller team size, is we've never really been brought up heavily around the valuation. It really comes down to the opportunity for the employee and what the risk is for them given their current circumstance. And so one thing we've definitely seen around Pittsburgh uh, is that cash is still potentially a little bit more um, valuable than in essentially sometimes equity um, because it is still kind of, we don't necessarily have that full kind of Bay Area mindset, I don't think yet. I think it's getting there. Um, but with that, I think when you're thinking about valuation too, it's also the risk of your equity. And so when you're looking at a company that maybe is larger, it comes off as less risky. And so I don't think it's necessarily the valuation itself, but maybe it's the investors that you have, the amount of runway, and then the access to when that liquidity actually occurs. And that becomes a little bit more the deciding factor when you think about the kind of, I guess, compensation package and attracting talent. Got it. Did yeah. you know I'm not... Justin, we had talked about this in prep too. So um, thinking about it a little bit more, I think um, what really strikes me and like my spidey sense goes off of that, like I reject the premise, like one of the things, um, you know, we talked about the, the 20 things you need to be good at as a founder, um, raising money is one of them, recruiting is the other, right? Like one of the others, right? Um, one of the, I mean, like a bear flag, like it's no secret, we're in the Bay Area, right? We got um, Google and Facebook literally a mile from the office. Google X is a mile from the office. Facebook's global headquarters is two miles from the office. Like everyone on the team could make more next Monday, right? Like there's so much opportunity for anyone. And so you need to get good at recruiting people that want to join the team, want to have the impact and want to be along for this mission and inherently want to be in this room solving this problem with these people. Like, of course, valuation is one of the things, but like, like, I mean, there's so many other components there too. Like, you know, what's my job title? What's my salary? What's the valuation of the company? What can I get down the street? What's this team working on? What's that team working on? There's so many shiny objects, especially in the Bay Area. As a founder, you just need to get really good at recruiting, right? Like finding the type of people that are going to fit really well in your organization and then doing everything you can to pull them in and keep them engaged and keep them motivated, right? Like that is a core competency. Um, and valuation is like one of the obstacles in a landscape of shiny objects. Yeah. No, thanks. That's I. I. I mean, it's it, the perspective is important, and again, geographic differences, but also I think, you know, pointing out the fact that like, you guys, someone you hire today is going to get to work with you guys, like hand in hand, right? So like, like you're solving problems together, not necessarily as part of a you know a really massive organization. You mentioned they're all great, you can make a lot of money, but like the impact is different when you walk down the hall and you're like, hey, like what's up with this thing? You know, how can we take it from A to B, right? I, and I think that's one of, oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just add one quick thing. Like, I think that's one of the really cool things about ag and like Brandon gets this too, right? One of the hardest things about hardware is taking it to the field and doing the thing, right? But that's also one of the most rewarding, right? Like you build something on Monday and it's working in the field, growing food on Tuesday. Um, and then you spend Wednesday, Thursday, Friday debugging it because it doesn't, it doesn't really work <laughs> anyway, right? But like, that's the cool part, right? And you need like, like, you need to love that pain. Like you need to love those short cycles. You need to love the grittiness of it. That's, that's the draw here. And like someday you may have a big day, but like I hand over heart, I've never recruited on having a big day someday. I'm like, I, I can't guarantee that. I can't promise you that. That's not something I can control. Sure. I'm working towards it, but I can't control that. What I can promise you is engaging impactful work that will actually have an impact on the things that we want to have an impact on. And when that calculus changes from you, like, I wish you luck, but as long as we can provide that, that's what I'm working for. You know, especially for us, uh, it's really, really impactful when you go to the grocery store and you, well, now we recognize almost every brand of tomato there and we know which ones you want to buy and which ones you don't. But when you see the ones that like your system picked, 
to know that you actually had a part in having that tomato end up on the grocery store shelf. I think too, for us, we kind of also go to layer deeper for every tomato and every greenhouse we help construct, we're saving water, we're saving land, uh, we're saving emissions. And so actually keeping track of that, not just the physical impact when you go to the store, but then also the large scale impact that you can have. And also the impact, not just on the product that you're creating, but as Gino was saying, internally, it's not like you're in a 2000 person org where all day you're building a detection model for what does a stop sign look like? And here are all the edge cases for a stop sign. Instead, you're literally setting the strategic direction of what are the most important things that the company needs to be working on. And you get to, for some people, you thrive on this. For some people, it's scary, but the company will more or less live or die based on the decisions we make and the ability for our team to execute. And so it attracts some people, it scares some other people away. But I think to Gina's point, it is a big part of, you know, certain people really like this and certain people don't. I was going to add, actually, and I now I have two points because Brandon yeah. just raised a good point. Well, I was going to say one sort of adjunct component to what Eugenio and Brandon talked about is as it relates to valuation, you know, one of the risks that founders face in this era of money falling from the skies is that it is too easy to raise too much money. And especially if you're an early stage company, sort of series C, series A, even potentially sort of series B and starting to scale is over-optimizing for valuation and not optimizing for the right partner at a venture firm who really understands what you're building and can really help you solve problems. And so I would say the startup that I was at fell, fell victim to that. We sort of over-optimized on valuation. We got a partner who was used to working with companies kind of a little bit later than we were, but couldn't really help us when we hit hyper uh, scale. You know, we went and we were a consumer messaging app called Voxer. And we went over the course of four days from 100,000 daily users to a quarter million, to a half a million, to three quarters, to a million. So 10x in four days over Thanksgiving. And we raised money and we didn't think through, you know, we need someone who really understands the nitty gritty of continuing to make that work, that kind of viral magic, different than robotics. I'm, I, I'm not going to pretend this is the same for you guys. But like the point was, is that we should have picked someone who really understood early product market fit, not later scale. And that I think is a risk. And, you know, especially as you bring on investors, you know, you have to look at that as a marriage. You're going to be with them for better or for worse for, you know, the next probably eight to 10 years. And you really want to find someone who will support you, help you build your business. And to be honest, if you were to raise money at a $200 million post money valuation instead of 120, but take someone who's not as well equipped to help you, it won't matter when you're to Gino's point, you're worth zero. It doesn't matter anymore because your company is worth zero. If you're worth 120 million at the time, you know, time equals one and he helps you or she helps you really scale your business over the next three or four years and you're worth a billion dollars, that's worth a lot more than zero. And so I think that's really important. And I think to Brandon's point also on employees, some people get scared by this kind of the, the unknowns of building a startup. And that's okay. Like what you do as founders and CEOs is try to find the people who are like, I don't need the security and the extra money of Facebook down the street. I want to build something. I want to have it matter. So, I mean, I remember when we went viral, the fact that, you know, for the next year, I would walk around San Francisco and you would hear the chirp of Voxer on other people's smartphones. And you're like, that's amazing because we built that in my living room. So like, you have to have people that want that and want to be with you to build that, not someone who's there for just for the paycheck, you know, and I get it, there are regional differences. But you want someone who's committed and believes in what you're working on. And that's the kind of person that will help you build your business over time. And ideally, you know, everyone then helps, you know, in the right way to scale a business without worrying about the valuation today. Awesome. Oh, that's that's a yeah. huge point that you brought up, Andy, that uh, Gina and I have definitely experienced and learned, but didn't verbalize yet. Is that, I'd say that's actually, for me personally, a lesson out of YC, is YC really, really pushes the notion that your investors are there for the long term, And so you need to pick your partners wisely and to not, I think the phrase is perfect, do not over-optimize for valuation. It's really about the partnership. And so we've been incredibly lucky. We have investors who have literally scaled robotics companies from never existing to having, I guess by today, over billion dollar exits. And we have investors in agriculture who know what it's like to build inside ag. They see where the future of ag is going. They know ag and they know what it takes in ag to build a reliable and a good product. And I really think having that expertise is, is key. 
yeah, yeah, chalk me, chalk me up to completely agree. Like, um, the only thing I can possibly add is we put our money where our mouth is coming out of YC. We took a lower valuation from true ventures because they're awesome. They're founder friendly. Those are the folks we want to have on for the ride. And then case in point, we hit a pandemic um, and the company wouldn't be here if we had not made that decision. Um, it, it, it paid itself forward completely, like no hesitation. The other thing to call out too, Andy, is like the fear around startup. Like one of the things I try to vocalize the most in panels like this is startups really, really hard. And from the outside, when you look in, like hopefully as, if Brandon and I as founders have done the right thing, like the the media cycles hit when things are going really well. And if you like Google bear flag, it looks like, oh my God, this is like up to the right, like perfectly straight line, like little bit, little bit exponential there. Um, and it's just not the case, right? Like we sample at the high points, but most of it's down in these chasms of despair, like as we go, right? Like it's awful, like it's really dang hard. Um, and it's not, um, I can speak for myself. It's not that I have this superpower of no fear or this crystal ball. Like, no, it's actually really hard. Um, like quite literally, I look at, pictures of myself five years ago and I look like a different person. I look 10 years younger, right? Like wrinkles and hair and um, all sorts of things, right? Um, thankfully, like my, my marriage survived a startup and that's a credit to my wife, not to me, right? But like this takes a real toll. Like it is a full contact sport. Um, you you are just like, pardon my language, but you are in the shit for so long, right? Like it, it feels like it and you smell like it. you still like right now, like, like, like getting this like smell of death off me like coming out of this right like i can't like i, I can't emphasize that enough and I, I believe this audience to be mostly founders and i just want to like say that that there's no part of this is that's easy and if, if it feels easy like either you're a superpower genius or you're delusional like it is very very hard and raising money is one of the most ruthless savage things you may have to go do um i get it um and uh you're not alone you know, that's uh, you, when we, you know, to your point, you, you know, when we went viral, you know, all of a sudden these news stories are like overnight success. And you're like, actually, it was four years of like hard toil. And, you know, in my particular role, I was CFO and did a lot of biz dev. I spent my I spent those intervening four years banging my head against, you know, the carriers, you know, Timo, AT&T, Verizon, trying to get them to preload us onto their phones. Thankfully, the app store saved us go around that but like fool's errand right and so it was like an overnight session like not even close like we have and we have so much more to do and so you're right you, you look at the news cycles it looks easy and it's not right like if you're i mean i guess if it's easy you're either not solving a real problem or you're not realistic about what you're trying to build right and so i think that's an important distinction which is if you're doing something valuable it's going to be hard awesome thank you guys that's uh Really um, great, great, great points and, and um, love to feel the energy from you guys. It's awesome because this is like real. This is like reading off a script, but you know, I mean, this is, feels so real. So it's great to get the emotion. Okay. So we're, we're getting toward the end here. I absolutely have to do this because this is like the closest I ever get to be Guy Raz. So I'm, I'm just going to take the opportunity for this now. So you had a busy summer, Gina, okay? So let's just talk about strategics for a second, okay? Um, could you talk a little bit about the process or or sort of the relationship there, right, with Deer? And, and clearly, it couldn't have just been Deer, right? You don't have to get into it, but everybody probably was calling you up. So could you just talk about that, how you sort of got to where you are from where you start talking to folks to where you are today? Yeah, it, um like what I'm going to say next applies once again across all 20 of the, th the, the things, right? And people do business with people, right? This is recruiting, right? This is fundraising. This is building strategic relationships. Um, Aubrey, my co-founder, I made it our business to get to know decision makers at these companies, right? And it wasn't so much because we want to get acquired. And of course, like not to be coy, that was like certainly on our minds someday, but we want to understand how they think about the world. What do they see? What do they, what do they think the challenges are and how, like what's the mismatch between what we think the challenges are and is there some insight that we have that they've overlooked or is there some way that we can demonstrate um, something cool that they're trying to do, right? Like all the things, right? Like all the things and you just get to know people, right? Um, we were exceedingly lucky to be selected for John Deere's startup collaborator in 2019. Um, and quite literally these relationships are made over like steak and beer um, in Iowa, right? Like get on the plane, go fly out and, and meet the people, right? Um, and one of the cool things about that, and this is not, this is not revisionist history. This is not like rose-colored glasses. Is there was this tremendous culture fit 
between the small company that we were building and also this large, you know, behemoth market leader, which I think really clicked, right? Um, and that helped that helped um, build the relationship. Now, like, not to say that wasn't the case at other places too. We also made our business um, to fly to Chicago, right? Like, we made our business to host other um, other OEMs, right? Like from Japan, right? Um, other places, and we 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 um, we nurtured those relationships. That's just part of the job. Um, it's, it's just something you also have to do. Awesome. Um... And that's and, and obviously, and Andy, you alluded to this earlier, the strategic interest, like we see it, you know, as a as a firm, we bank all these monster companies, right? And we will get calls, my team and Andy's team about, you know, hey, do you know a this kind of company, right? Because because these big OEMs and others are looking for innovation and the innovation's happening in Pittsburgh and in the Bay Area, wherever it is. Um, and so and they're trying to find and meet. So so it's awesome. Um, so how and I'm just curious because it's it's pretty cool. Like, how did you let the team know? <laughs> like, so you and the board, you're all sitting there talking about you getting to this point. Like, is it like a Zoom call because of the world? Is it like everybody gets together? Like, like, could you just share a little bit about how you let the people know that like you've had this amazing sort of thing happen? Yeah, this is low key nerve wracking. Um, I um, it was surprised me how nerve wracking it was. So leadership knew, right? Aubrey and I yeah. obviously have been working on the deal for like four months. Um, and we pulled in some engineering leads for diligence. Um, and so there were a handful of folks that knew. Um, but we 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 had a team building event, um, which is not going to be a team building. But that's the only like plausible reason to pull everyone together. And we have a big hangar, right? We're an ag company. We've got tractors and everything. So we're all standing around. And um, the, you know, coming back to my earlier point, like I'd never recruited on an exit. I never recruited on your shares turning into dollars. I turned into we're going to change the world. And it was never... Um, once again, I don't have to be crass. It was never like a middle finger to everyone. It was just like, we're doing our thing, right? Like they're doing our th their thing, but we're doing our thing, right? Um, and we control our own destiny because we understand the need and we have product market fit. And we're actually delivering value to growers and like, like really kind of screw the noise. Like it doesn't matter. We're doing our thing. Um, and so pulling folks, um, pulling folks into the hangar um, and I won't share too much about the details, but I was like, hey, listen, this opportunity came up and um, it aligns closely with the impact that we want to have, right? Like everything we're doing can be multiplied. There's a multiplier effect, um, but people were still hesitant, right? This was a this is a massive reframing of what they thought their next years would look like, and it happened like that. And so there had to be um, there had to be like as a founder, as a leader, I had adult space for that, right? It was a lot of one on one conversations, with, um, but through the course of the day, and then um, I'll share like with this group, like once again, not about the money, um, but like. Um, the money changes people's lives, right? Um, and like, I, I'll try not to get emotional talking about it, but some real hardened guys, some guys who um, like ops team engineers, like um, had really emotional moments, right? These guys, like tears are like running down their face in the office when we're presenting sort of like what, what the outcome of this deal was. Um, that was a really powerful moment. I'll stay with me forever. Um, those are those are some of the best conversations I've ever had. Yeah, well, I mean... You certainly deserve it, and and all the pride and, and everything you did. Um, thanks for sharing because it's a pretty it's a pretty special moment. To, to your point, all the time you spent those drops, right, <laughs> to be there, right, <laughs> like, and those guys were with you, right, arm in arm, those men oh and women, God. right. Yeah. So like, yeah, um, these are all the people who left companies, right, whose bosses told them they're throwing away their careers, right, both in engineering and in ag, right, um, yeah. especially in ag, right. These these folks worked for some of the biggest farms in Salinas. And they're on career trajectory to be managers and farm managers and, um, you know, owners in the future, right? And they they left that to come join Fair Flag and everyone told them they're idiots. Um, and it's not like Silicon Valley politely. It's saying it feel like you're a fucking idiot, dude. Um, and they came they came and joined Bear Flag. Um, and so to have that sort of have that sort of vindication um, was huge. It was, I'm thrilled to be a part of that. Yeah, amazing. Well, we could go on forever. Well, you guys have stuff to do. I mean, I I would sit here forever, but um, we have Q and A. I think so. I see Jen and and Joel, and I think we're going to start Q and A. But before we go to that, thank you guys so much. I mean, this was so much fun, and and thanks for sharing the stories. And I don't know who wouldn't want to go work for you guys. Like like you guys wouldn't hire me because I couldn't help you anyway. But like I'm sure there's a lot of great people out there that that are that can go help you guys out. And um. And I uh, would love to work with you guys. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Andy and I work together, so I don't have to thank him because I get to see him all the time. So it's, but, but, but thanks for your time, Andy. I'll thank you anyway. So.
Great discussion, everyone. So now we're going to switch over. Uh, we've got some fantastic uh, inquiries from the audience who are curious uh, about some things. And uh, I'm, I'm actually just going to start with the one we have had several questions, and it's about talent. It's about recruiting. It's about hiring. And so I'm just going to sum up. We have a variety of questions from a variety of you. And something that was um, top of mind is when it comes to hiring, when it comes to recruiting, right, when the skills you need, uh, when you've got the opportunity to hire experienced candidates uh, versus uh, recent or current undergraduates, right, who happen to have a certain skill set versus international students who are recently graduating. So if, if, if Brennan and, and um, Gino, if you could comment just a little bit about those three categories and, you know, do you actively look for those types of candidates and why or why not? Yeah, so I can give my thoughts to Gino probably have a, a little bit more in depth because your team was uh, just a little bit bigger uh, than uh, we are today. Uh, so what I can say is it's very role specific when we think about these requirements. And at the core, we do have these foundational, almost like cultural personality traits we look for in every candidate. And that's just a part of being a part of four growers. Um, but then for each role, if it's something where it's about taking, you know, our director of mechanical engineer, for instance, today is responsible for going from kind of a first unit to 600 units in the field. And someone immediately out of college doesn't have that experience and their scar is to be able to know what are the missteps to make along the way. But on the other hand, we have like a robotics engineer who is straight out of his master's degree international, who we brought on because we really were looking for, you know, novel algorithms. How do you create the best motion planning that's never been done before? And I think people coming out of college are sometimes the best people for that. And so I think for us, it's very role specific and it's not at all like this one type only or this one type, not at all. It's very much, do they have the core cultural aspects? And then just looking at the specifics of the role, do they have enough expertise to be able to be successful? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it starts with values, right? Um, culture fit. And that's a different, I think that's a different conversation. You ever like, that's the like, the non-starter, right? Like it doesn't matter who you are if you don't if you don't align with our values and our culture. Like it's probably not going to work, and that's not a slight. It's just like our, this won't work. Um, um, the the to I, I'm not going to add too much. Brandon, it's a mix, right? So um, you need experienced people. Um, you can't have um, a team of only new grads, but also like a team of just experienced PhDs will be probably like equally ineffective. Um, and so you need um, you, you need that mix, right? Um, you need that mix. Um, and, uh, um, I think one of the things we did really well is hire senior people as leads and then fill in teams underneath them. Um, and we continue to do that, um, toggling back and forth. Great. Thanks for that. Another question we have is, uh, it's actually about international, um, graduates, but not so much about recruitment or talent. This one is more on the investor side, right? So, uh, how, how do investors uh, treat or help founders who might be recent international graduates? Um, is there anything that needs to be taken into account there? I don't know if Andy or, or Justin, if you have anything to, to comment on for that. Um, I assume that that relates to then, you know, international students that are looking to start companies. Um, yes, founders, international yeah. founders, sorry. Yeah. Great. So um, I would say the groundswell shift in the last 15 years is that venture has gone from a very parochial Northern California-based industry to a global industry. So, you know, I would say that, you know, you had Sandhill investors that have been around for 40 plus years, you know, helping build HP and, you know, companies, Cisco way back, Microsoft, things like that, you know, from the, the 70s, um, where you had to come to Sandhill and you had to, you know, knock on every door. And we did this at Boxer. We had, you know, two dozen meetings to end up with one investor um, and not the right one, as it turned out. So, you know, we knocked on the doors. What's really changed is, no, I mean, it's part of a function of just the technology has allowed investors and founders and vice versa to be closer together without actually having to be, you know, at the airport at San Francisco and driving south for, for 40 minutes. Um, but I think the industries are broad, right? So now you have, in, you know, all of the leading U.S. investors have offices in, you know, New York. Uh, they may have in L.A. Uh, they might be in Austin. They've, they've started to spread their wings and they certainly travel, right? Like I'd say three years ago, you started to see VCs getting on planes, heading to places much more than you ever did before. And I would say that includes going to Europe coming to Asia, uh, going to Latin America. And I would say that you also have the venture industries in each of those regions have really 
developed themselves in the last five years. And so, you know, Europe has just hit a high of venture investing in the last year. Um, again, not surprising, but it has become a dominant player in its own right. So I think that what would have been a challenge if you were an international founder 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, has really lessened to the point that like, if you've got, if you are a impressive founder with a, a, a real sort of groundbreaking opportunity and vision, those investors will find you. That's what it comes down to. You know, if you're building something good, they will find you. Excellent. So uh, another question we have around uh, investment is um, we've got one here that says robotics uh, automation, the adoption right of robotic automation is uh, is happening right. It's here, but it is in an early state in terms of the adoption. So we have a question here that's asking uh, how many risks are investors willing to take uh, because it might be a longer cycle due to the adoption. Um, until the revenues are, are earned in contrast with a software right investment uh, or something like that. I feel, um, I feel very passionate about this. Um, a huge mistake Verify made and a huge mistake I see other folks making. Uh, investors don't care about your tech. Like they don't care. Um, to like their detriment or to their benefit doesn't matter. The investors certainly the ones we talk to believe that an engineering team will solve this problem. Like they will underwrite that technical risk all day long. What they're looking for proof in is does this company know how to access the wallets of their target customers? Like that is the biggest risk. That's what makes every, that like, that's what fear, makes investors afraid, right? It's not, it's not can bear flag build autonomous tractors. Like actually like most people are willing to accept you like, Oh, da, 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 da. like you see, like, what they've done, you see the prototype, like, yeah, they'll get, like, it doesn't work right now, but they'll get there, right? Like, that's actually a pretty easy thing to underwrite. It's, do farmers need this? How much will they pay for it? When will they use it? How will it be supported in the field? Are they gonna pay for a subscription? Are they gonna pay up front? How do I know, as an investor, how do I know that what Egino is telling me is true about how these customers behave? Like, that is where the investor conversations happen. It's not about the tech, right? And that's the trouble, like, I'm a, I'm a Carnegie Mellon engineer, right? Like we come to it, like, we're like, oh, but look at this shiny object, which is the thing that I've built and no one gives a hoot. They want to know, can that thing make money? Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Brandon's crushing it right now. You get contracts, you get revenue, you get LOIs, you get customer testimonials. You do everything you can to demonstrate that you understand that customer behavior and they're willing to sign on the line, be it a promise, um, dollars are better than anything else, more dollars are better that this technology, this like little shiny object will work for them at scale, right? Like that's what you need to prove as a founder. Um, that's the conversation I have the most with early stage founders about how to raise money is like, get out of that and get into this. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Brandon, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, one piece, I think that's core number one. Like, you know, killed it. That's the biggest thing by far. Uh, the other piece I would add is you also, uh, I don't necessarily want to group investors into one category. Um, I think it is very important to remember that you have different types of investors inside that term investors. And some investors are more predisposed to different metrics and different risks than others. Um, so like a strategic, strategic investor is looking for something very different than like a Sequoia or an A16Z investor. Um, so just make sure when you're going through your pitches and you're looking at who you're raising from, keeping that in mind and tailoring it, tailoring it or at least just taking the feedback with that lens of knowing that this is that type of investor that I just spoke with. Excellent. Now you touched on this earlier, but um, we've had a direct question here from Frank who wants to know how many different investors did you meet before you were able to get right, your, your desired result or capital and how long does it take to get the money? It's not a clear, easy answer, I know, but how would you how would you answer that question? Those questions. A ton and a long time, uh, longer than you think. So we did our pre-seed. Um, we talked to fifty investors, and we got five that actually gave us money, and that's a ten percent yield, which I thought was atrocious and awful, and it turns out to be like really damn good. Um, it took us three months to raise our pre-seed, which was um, you know not a ton of money as far as like rounds go, and we thought like. God, um, that three months took forever. We never want to do that again. Like, like how delusional we were, right? We got out of YC, um, we raised the next round. Um, then we started raising Series A um, in January of 2020. Um, and the round was going okay. 
Um, we could have used more traction. Um, we could have used more contracts. And then COVID hit and the bottom fell out. Um, and I think my investor list right now is like two or 300 investors um, that I've talked to. Um, and precious few of those have given us money. Um, it's grueling and it's awful. Um, and they string you along. And like, you never hear, like sometimes you hear a solid no, but you never like will really hear a solid no. It's like, oh, let's be in touch, right? Um, and it's an emotional roller coaster. So there's no easy part about it. Like it can't sugarcoat this, like it's pretty rough. Um, and that's just part of the grip muscle you have to build. Um, if, uh, listen, if the first three investors want to give you money, like you probably talk to a lot more because you're undervaluing the company. Like go get some no's to like really understand like what your market value is. Um, it's just a sales process. Yeah, and I think with that, a, a key thing that we've really been uh, hyped on and has been told to us by many different people is always run a parallel process, never run a serial fundraising process. And so what that means is don't talk to one investor, wait for their response, talk to another investor, wait for their response. The goal is to, like what Agino said, have a list of 200. When you want to go raise, maybe take a small section because you don't want to burn all 200 if you have a bad pitch. And then start a, start a cycle with maybe 10 investors who you think maybe aren't your number one option, but maybe the number two just to like get a warm up. Ideally, if you have your own investors practice before then, and that alone can potentially take, you know, a month just in warm up, uh, getting ready for, for fundraising. And then from there, then you can start taking a bigger section, maybe then like talk to 40 people in your next cycle. And then maybe after two weeks, you start another cycle of another 40 people. And it really is just uh, grueling. Uh, and I think to Gino's point, we kind of thought the same thing because both of us came out of YC. Our pre-seed round was amazing. You know, pre-seed coming out of YC, you have demo day, you have like 3,000 investors all coming to your feet like, I want to give you money. And we, we kind of knew that this was a very spoiled way to raise and to be able to raise a round in just a month or two months. I was very lucky. But then it's not to really get to the next round that you can really fully understand uh, how spoiled that was. Excellent. So the next question I have here is submitted um, for Ichino and Brandon. So how much of an influence do your investors have on your strategic business initiatives? And they clarified a little further just to say like ag tech and other uh, sort of niches, right, are a little unique when it comes to industry specialties and things. So, um, and they get the feeling that people outside of the organization and industry as a whole may struggle to always make the right decisions. Um, you know, of course, they might feel entitled to make such decisions because it's their money. Uh, and then the sort of yes, question mark. Um, so if, uh, if either of you or both of you could comment on that. Yeah, um, this is a fear, right? Um, and it comes back to picking your investors, right? Um, crappy investors like angel investors have too much time will micromanage you. Um, and it's just like a huge warning sign. You want to talk to other founders um, who, who've taken money from them before taking their money um, and make sure that's not going to happen. We were super, it comes back to like, we took money from True Ventures at a lower valuation than we could have because they understand we're trying to go in. They also trusted us to steer the ship. And when we needed help, which was often, we came to them and they offered advice, but it was never attached to do the thing that I, that, you know, follow my advice. It was like, I'm here for you when you need it, but we invest in you because we believe in you and we believe in that you will make the right decisions, right? Um, I don't, um, Aubrey may like maybe I have rose colored glasses Aubrey might read me or hear me say this and, and barf but like I don't remember a time we were ever compelled to do something we didn't want to do from our investors like that just didn't happen that wasn't a thing typically we were lost in space like asking for advice from people we trusted we we're very grateful for those conversations I'm just going to add if it's all right I think Eugenia makes a great point there you especially early when you're doing sort of seed rounds and you're bringing in angels you need to be very careful because they can be a time suck with no return for you right well we had investors at Boxer who were like can I get a status update every six weeks and you know you have to say no you cannot right we're heads down building this business and frankly like what you should have assumed is when you put in your 50k is that it's going to go to zero until it doesn't right? And we'll come back to you when something has changed, right? And so you have to be very careful because they will eat up all your time. And Eugenio you know, makes a great point. So true in his case, right? Like they are professionals, like they understand the risks. They want to be there to help, but they don't want to be in your way because that's totally contrary to building a business. And so they're the big, big difference between sort of angel investors who are worried about the money they gave you versus a venture firm. It's like there's acceptable risk, we're going to just take the risk when we put the money in, but we're going to trust them to go do what they need to do. So be careful. 
Yeah, I think we've had a similar experience uh, to Gino, where because we've been so selective in investors, we, we've had great investors. And it's really been, uh, for us, like the perfect investors, they have a lot of expertise, they have a lot of knowledge, they've done this before. And so you're not the first, and they're not going to be worried about, am I going to lose my money? Um, and then they're always available for when you want their advice. And so we really have been lucky to be able to ask investors, people with lots of experience for their thoughts. But it, like Gino said, it's never a, you have to do this. It's a, here's my thoughts. Like uh, you can do whatever you want because it's your company. You know way more about it than what I do because I'm just on the outside. Uh, well, not quite outside, a little bit more than that, but uh, compared, I'm not in the day-to-day. -day. And I think a, a good investor understands that and they trust you like Gino said to make the right decisions. And the other thing too, just uh, not necessarily investor specific, but just founder specific is everybody has their own perspectives and histories and the amount of like whiplash you can get when you talk to like a good sample of people of all the different contradictory viewpoints of what is the right thing to do is really that that's kind of our job as founders is to take that and consolidate what makes sense for us in our situation and being able to really understand that and making sure you have investors that know that as well. Excellent. The only thing I'll add there, Andy, Andy reminded me, um, we didn't get a lot of reach out. One of the things that we did, and I'm not sure it was a good thing, I'm not sure it was a bad thing, we did a monthly investor update, um, came out to like three pages in Google Docs, it was like, I wrote a note, it was like three paragraphs, like, what are we doing this month, where are we going, like, what's exciting? And then we had like metrics, like, we tracked like autonomous miles for a while, autonomous acres, like what you measure, what you measure grows, right? And we tracked burn. Um, and some technical progress. And it was much an exercise for us to keep ourselves honest um, in the early days about us hitting our OKRs and being public about that. Because I knew when I didn't want to write an investor update, like those like, probably didn't have the most productive four weeks we could have. Um, and like, if I'm like, if I'm like dreading writing this, like that's probably a good tell. Um, but it also meant that we brought investors on for the ride and, um, you know, like it's a small world and they have copies and they talk, you know, and like you want to generate a hyper under company. And so getting in front of them every four weeks and um, I, th I think was a good thing. I I'd probably do that again. Uh, it was time well spent. And we do the same thing. We, we try to do monthly. It's not always monthly, um, but the top line of that's always asks because um, there's, there's just kind of general asks. We feel bad asking each individual investor. Uh, so it's a nice way to get kind of those general asks out. And then when you have more specific questions, you just ping those investors directly. Great. And then, um, well, we're, we're down to the last 10 minutes here, but I think we're, we're almost to the end of our question. So uh, it looks like we've um, got a couple of people who said, do you have any advice for uh, emerging founders um, in robotics who are looking for, how, how should they be networking, right? What are some, what are some, what's some advice you can give them in terms of networking opportunities with market leaders in robotics? My advice so is actually for market funny. leaders or for investors? Uh, well, the questions are specifically about market leaders in robotics, but um, any advice I'm sure you have for uh, new founders or emerging founders as to how to best spend their networking time in robotics probably would be helpful. Again, yeah, isn't the Pittsburgh like Robotics Network, isn't that the answer? Well, I'm glad you said that, <laughs> Justin. Uh, <laughs> that was close off planted question. I'm sorry. Apologize, guys. No, that's fine. Sure. If you follow the Pittsburgh Robotics Network on social media. We have a variety of virtual and in-person programs that are very, very de uh, devoted to networking. Uh, you can also visit us at robopgh.org for a variety of events and opportunities. But beyond the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, what other sort of industry or market leader leading areas would you guys recommend? So um, he here's, here's what I recommend folks do, and it's hard. And it's scary and it's not easy and we did not do this, but like in hindsight, this is what we should have done. And what I'm going to posit like just broadly without a strong basis, every robotics founder should do is go sell the product before you have anything. Like get some CAD drawings, put together some augmented reality, like build like a totally fake video. Don't, don't pretend it's real. It's not what I'm saying, but use it as a visual. Go meet your customers and understand what the value is. Get that LOI. If you can get a down payment, if you can get a down payment on a product that doesn't exist and won't exist for several years, oh my gosh, like not only, not only are you going to get the investor dollars flooding in, but you're also going to build conviction around what you're building and you're going to know that there's a market for it, right? Like, please don't confuse this with BS. Like, please do not do that. Like I despise founders that do that. I won't name names, but there's folks in ag tech who do that, but use it as a tool to stimulate the imagination of your customers and build excitement. And if you can get it in writing that they want to buy this product, that is way, way more productive time spent 
than like firing up Ross and trying to get some Arduinos to move some things and like doing like a cool demo. Like, don't waste your time on that. Go meet your customer and talk to your customer. I think the follow on thought is we did a pretty remarkably poor job building hype around our company in Silicon Valley, but growers and every grower in Salinas knew about us, right? Like, like the customers and the users and the people that would be most benefited from our product um, and those industries did know about Verify. Um, it's because we spent time there. Yeah, I think we take a, actually a similar approach in terms of that last part of genome that the branding is almost, uh, most people don't know what we do publicly. Uh, we haven't made any loud noise, but if you go inside the greenhouse industry, uh, everybody knows, knows who we are. Um, and I guess that this person's original question of kind of market, uh, networking market leaders, I think probably my first question would be to understand that the why uh, they want to network. Because I do think to building a business, you don't necessarily need a really great network of uh, market leaders. Um, I think it goes back to kind of what Gino, Gino said, if you have really great product market fit, things will work out. And if you hire the right people, things will work out. Um, so I think that's really kind of priority one is finding that product market fit, not necessarily having this amazing network. Um, but in terms of that network piece, what I found is generally uh, founders are very open uh, and very uh, willing to share their experiences. And I've met multiple founders just from a, a cold LinkedIn message, like not even a warm intro. Uh, and people are just more than happy to meet. I've also found, especially in Pittsburgh, that's very true because uh, it's starting to become more of a thing. And thank you, PRN, for, for making it and helping to foster this. Um, but there aren't a ton of us here and so when you meet another person who is one, it, it's pretty exciting. Um, and so it's generally, I think, just naturally building it out. One thing I'll add there, Jen, and this is unsolicited, um, I found, and I think Brandon and I do this like pretty well, right? Um, when you start a conversation with the founder, there's two ways it can go. It can be like a pissing contest, like this is how much I've raised, this is how big the team are, this is, this is the revenue, this is who is invested. And it's a totally non-productive conversation that makes both people leave feeling shitty. And if instead you're like, dude, this is what I'm struggling on. This is what I'm sure of. Like, holy crap, I'm middle of the fundraise. I'm not sleeping. I'm super stressed. I'm fighting with my co-founder. Like we just had a lead engineer leave. Like we just turned a customer or we have six weeks of runway left. Like that can be a really positive, helpful conversation because you realize that you're both in this shit together. Um, and I try to bring that to conversations. Hopefully I've done that here now. Um, but when you sit down with founders, like um, it can go one of two ways. And like just bringing, like bringing the garbage can be a much more fulfilling, like meaningful relationship than flexing about like the, the metrics that you think matter or don't matter or whatever. Hey, I, that, you know, that's a great point. You know, I would, I look back at Voxer and I was like, we would make a great Harvard Business Review case study of all the things you can do wrong almost make it and still have things go wrong and not succeed. And, you know, again, like a lot of it's common, right? A lot of it is like, was our founding team too big? Not like clear enough, like ownership and, and like calling the ball when you had to call the ball, right? Like, and I go on and on. We like took too long to launch our minimal viable product, right? You know, like again and again. So I would say to your point, like, you know, looking for people that are really willing to say like, here are the failures I've gone through and learn from those because you learn from failures, not from success, to be totally honest. And so you want someone who's like, look, like this is hard. Here are the things that you probably should be thinking about. And I have suffered through these and I've come out hopefully the other side, you know, with some, you know, some improvement in where I go next. But totally agree. Like looking for someone who's just, you know, sort of been successful and isn't willing to share the real hard knocks, not going to be helpful. So why don't we go ahead and end there? And I think we have our next event. Um, you know, the failures in this space. Uh, and listen, I want to thank everybody. First, let me just thank Jen Apicella, um, who was monitoring questions and answers. Uh, Jen is our program director, uh, very instrumental in making this webinar happen and putting together a great conversation. Let me also thank uh, Brad Jocks, who's the man behind the scenes, uh, not to be seen, but uh, extremely important to what we do here. Um, I, you know, listen, first, I, I've been listening. Uh, I love this discussion. It was chock full of great lessons and quotes, uh, maybe even too many uh, to recount. I have to say, too, I love robotics. I love the companies in this space. Uh, no offense to other companies. Um, we're not just selling online coupons, uh, you know, and, you know, hardware, robotics is hardware, hardware is hard. 
And this is why we wanted to do this event uh, led by Justin and Andy and the team at JP Morgan, because we weren't looking for fundraising 101. And, but despite all of that, uh, robotics is still um, uh, uh, governed by business fundamentals. Um, a lot of those themes came out here where you have to recruit, you have to, you have, to have a strong vision, um, really important to focus on the customer and make sure you have the right product. And then managing the operations and, and the finances. Let, let me just pull a couple of impressions I had, if I may, with the last minute or two that we have. Um, this is unique. It was said by Andy, this is a unique time for raising capital. Money is just raining from the sky. Um, and, and in many cases, that's true. But I think it also means if you're under that rainstorm, um, if, you do, if you find that you're having difficulty in raising money, reach out to Justin. Um, reach out to any one of us, get to know us, uh, get to know these entrepreneurs. Uh, we're certainly here to help, um, but uh, follow those fundamental points of product market fit, understanding your customer and, and being sure to find the right investors. Um, it's so true. I experienced myself when you get to the point of scaling, you face these issues that you may not have anticipated when you started your company. To think that you sign this multi-million dollar contract, but um, you have to purchase the equipment, you have to scale the operation, you have to deploy it. You may have to ship it across international borders um, and deploy a team all before you get a significant amount of cash that comes with that sale. Um, and I think sometimes too, in my own experience, entrepreneurs focus too much on the cost of that capital and, and don't realize the, the importance of the cash um, and the valuation, enterprise valuation that you're creating. So use debt financing. I think that is an important thing. And many of us meet people uh, that provide that, but really understanding and building strategies around it is so important. And Brandon, thank you for the comment about investors are not just one category. Um, it, they can't easily be grouped you know, in that manner. And so put the work to understand who's the best investor for you. I really love the discussion about the value, uh, the, the impact of valuation on talent and traction. And it was very interesting to me that it's not just Pittsburgh where we are mission driven. Being in robotics, we, we have this, um, you know, this kindred opportunity, mission and motivation do matter. And you really can make an impact. It's, it's not humanoids looking to take over the world. Uh, we're really solving existential you know, issues. Um, and, and doing it with advanced machines. And uh, lastly, I'll, I just I took note that you know about raising money again, a good comment that uh, it's not a serial process. And I and myself have looked at it as a sales process. Build a pipeline. Um, be diligent in your approach. Uh, nurture these leads and figure out the best way to close. Um, so in many ways, it's not altogether different from that. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody. Justin, thank you very much. Uh, we flipped roles today. I had the crisp uh, button down shirt. <laughs> You're in the t-shirt. Um, and actually just for folks, uh, we, the PRN is signing a memorandum of understanding uh, on a um, doing some uh, um, back and forth with the trade group. Uh, so we're going to be signing something late tonight with the Taiwan U.S. Alliance and the Taiwan Automation Intelligence and Robotics Association. Good example of how we can help uh, our stakeholders. And uh, Justin, also want to thank you and Andy and J.P. Morgan uh, for your support. Andy, it's a real pleasure getting to know you. I know you had a lot of rain out there uh, this year, and it seems like there was a lot of cash mixed in with it. So uh, <laughs> uh, Brandon, appreciate it. Um, happy to hear all that you benefited at YC, but really, really um, pleased that you, you're you keeping this as a Pittsburgh company and, and growing it here. And Egino, thank you for your comments on being an entrepreneur. I felt like I started sliding into a support group meeting um, uh, at one point. So it was really uh, important, uh, you know, to bring those issues out. <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of love. Um, but then we finished with a motivational speech. Um, and uh, uh, that's really important for everyone. This program was recorded. It will be available later. I also want to let you know that we have some upcoming events. Tomorrow, we're partnering with One America Works on a recruiting event. So if you're listening to this, um, there's a link that's posted uh, in the chat or go to One America Works. And if you're looking for a job, you can meet upwards of 20 of the companies in Pittsburgh that are hiring, including uh, four growers. And then we will be announcing our first in-person business speaker series coming up soon for November. And this is going to highlight a number of the latest companies uh, that have been launching in Pittsburgh as startups. So 
uh, connect with us, get involved, uh, follow us at robopgh.org. Uh, and again, thank you to everybody on the panel. Take care. Thanks.